our solar system defies natural explanation. Yet creation fits the facts. We're going to explore this topic on this edition of Genesis Week. Welcome to this episode of Genesis Week, the weekly program of creationary commentary on news, views, and events pertaining to the Origins controversy made possible by the supporters of CORE Ottawa, Citizens for Origins Research and Education, and now carried on the Chris Genema Network, ChrisGenema.com, Christian Cinema at its finest. Excellence in pirate broadcasting, we moved into the abandoned Palace Theater to continue to bring you the information the anti-creationists don't want you to see or hear, and giving glory to our creator while doing it. Now, we here at Genesis Week believe your brain was intelligently designed, and God wants you to use it. Remember, if you get lost in cyberspace, you can just punch in wazulu.com or genesisweek.com and you can find us. And also subscribe to our YouTube channel to get extras like Crevo Rants and full interviews with our guests. I'm your host, Ian Juby. For decades, multiple creationists have pointed out the insurmountable problems for stellar evolution and deep time caused by the need for a naturalistic origin of our solar system. Now, there are numerous features within our solar system that defy all evolutionary models and even point to our solar system being young instead of many billions of years old. For example, physicist Wayne Spencer had been pointing out the problems that Jupiter's moon Io presents to deep time because of the ridiculous amount of heat the moon is pumping out. Now, obviously, an object can only put out heat for so long before it cools down. So therefore, the moon cannot be billions of years old. Now, Spencer had been pointing this out for decades and published the math on it in his 2003 ICC paper, which you can read here. Retired Sandia National Labs physicist, Dr. Russell Humphreys, went a step farther than just pointing at the problems for evolutionary interpretations. Humphreys took one of the most powerful steps you can take in science. He made predictions based on the biblical creation model for the magnetic fields of planets. Now, predictive power is one of the strongest tests of any scientific model. Evolutionary models make multiple predictions about planetary magnetic fields. So Humphreys asked the question, if creation were true, what would the evidence be? He then proposed a model based upon creation. If God created the planets, he could have created them with the original atoms having their nuclear spin axes pointing in the same direction. The many magnetic fields of the atoms lining up would be converted within seconds into a large electrical current within the planet, producing the electromagnetic field of the planet. The magnetic field would be strong at creation and would weaken over time. So based on this principle and the assumption that the planets were all only 6,000 years old, Humphreys predicted the magnetic fields of multiple planets, which at the time had not yet been measured. He published his predictions in a 1984 Creation Research Society quarterly paper. Now, since that time, five out of his six predictions have been fulfilled, while five out of six predictions made by evolutionary theories have failed miserably. We will find out about the sixth prediction in 2015 when the New Horizons spacecraft finally visits Pluto. Spike Paceris covered the problems that all the planets, moons, and our solar system cause when you invoke deep time. In fact, the problem is not that the planets and the moons, but rather men's theories and assumptions of deep time that's the problem. If you remove the assumption of billions of years, 
and the assumption of stellar evolution, there is no problem. These problems are a man-made artifact. An artifact of people rejecting the truth of creation and therefore having to concoct another explanation for planets, moons, our solar system, etc. Another explanation which simply will not work for the simple reason that it's not true. In Spike's phenomenal and informative volume one of What You Aren't Being Told About Astronomy, Spike detailed the problems caused by Io, as well as Saturn's rings, its moon Titan, and the topic that gets me hungry for Mexican food every time we talk about it, Enceladas. No, it's not a Mexican dish. It's one of Saturn's many moons. Now, everything about Saturn's rings scream that they are young. The lack of space dust on the rings, the braiding of the rings, the fact that over time the ice chunks would homogenize into one size, but yet they are all different sizes. Everything about the moons screams that they are young. Enceladus is spraying an incredible geyser of ice hundreds of kilometers high. How on earth could it do this for millions and millions of years? Short answer, it cannot. Titan has an atmosphere of methane, but sunlight destroys that methane. So the methane simply cannot last for many millions of years. Forget the billions of years of assumed evolutionary time required for the formation of these planets and moons. Spike had been detailing these problems in lectures since the early 90s, showing that these problems are only problems for the man-made theories invoking deep time. None of them cause problems for creation and a young Earth. In fact, everything about the solar system smacks of it being young, not billions of years old. So these facts actually support a young solar system and the interpretation of biblical creation. David Coppage have been citing myriads of problems the planets and moons present for deep time and stellar evolutionary theories for decades, documenting them on his very popular website, Creation Evolution Headlines, started back in 2000. But of course, Coppage had been pointing to short-lived solar system phenomena for many years before he started that website. The long and short of the story is that for decades, Creationary scientists have been pointing out the many, many lines of evidence that the solar system is young and cannot be explained by natural processes. Evolutionary theory has failed in both predictions and explanations for the solar system, while creationary models fit the facts just fine and have even made successful predictions to what we would find in the solar system. Now, just those facts alone should make any scientifically minded person sit up and ask questions and wonder if the solar system was created. So now this past week, an article came out in Nature website entitled Caught in the Act, written by Maggie McGee. The article acknowledges several of the very real problems evolutionary theory has in explaining various features found in our solar system. Saturn's rings provide multiple baffling mysteries. Even in the Nature article, McGee goes into detail about the problems with how young the rings appear to be, at most a few hundred million years. That's the maximum age, a far, far cry from several billion years that was expected. The rings are clean, no space dust, which would accumulate and darken the rings over hundreds of millions of years. Furthermore, there is no adequate natural explanation for the rings. Now, some speculate that it was perhaps a comet or comets that were trapped in orbit around Saturn. But this requires odds of astronomical proportions. You realize how hard it is to get something into orbit around a planet? And to maintain that orbit? Just ask NASA how difficult it is. Do you remember Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9? 
the comet that was sucked into a brief orbit around Jupiter in 1994, which promptly led to the disintegration of the comet, and the comet itself getting sucked into the planet, resulting in a spectacular explosion on Jupiter that was the size of Earth itself. You don't see comets getting captured in an orbit. You see them impacting planets. How many of you remember the Mars Climate Orbiter? Yeah, the one that crashed onto Mars due to a metric conversion error? Oops. The, the orbiter had to get to the planet at precisely the right location, speed, and trajectory in order to get into orbit. It didn't make it because it was off just a hair due to a math error. Now, this gives you an idea of just how hard it is to capture something in orbit, even with intelligence behind the wheel. It's a very delicate balancing act, and we should be astonished when NASA does get it right, because it's really, really hard to do. So, now, you have to multiply that balancing act by millions upon millions as you have many millions of large ice bodies in perfectly balanced orbit around Saturn. Two rings in the F-ring region are braided. They rotate around each other as they orbit the planet. You have two moons known as the dancing moons orbiting Saturn, one farther out than the other. Every four years, they switch places with the other in their orbits. Everything about Saturn's rings smacks of careful orchestration and youth. Do you really think all of this could continue on for millions and millions of years? No, the rings are just another piece of artwork in the solar system, with the rings themselves being the signature of the artist, the crowning glory of the beautiful planet. McGee then talks about Enceladus and its huge continental eruption of water from its south pole. Yeah, look at the size of it. You can quickly understand why so many scientists, including those who believe in deep time, have been astonished by this. There is no way this geyser could continue like this for millions of years. It must be recent. Not only that, but Enceladus is also giving off a tremendous amount of heat. 10 times what would be predicted if the heat was produced by radioactivity in its core and the moon being stretched and squeezed by the pull of gravity from Saturn. So where is all this heat coming from? One thing can be said, it can't be giving off heat like that for millions and millions of years. So everything about Enceladus speaks of a young age. But then McGee gets to Io, one of Jupiter's moons. A moon which gives off so much heat, it leaves Enceladus looking like a match compared to a bonfire. Volcanoes shooting lava at over 300 kilometers an hour and 280 kilometers high. One volcano on Io named Loki is more powerful than all of Earth's volcanoes combined. The entire moon is dotted with volcanoes from the incredible heat this moon is putting out. Do you think this moon could continue to pour out so much heat for millions of years? Of course not. And scientists don't think so either. Forget billions of years. Lastly, McGee gets to Titan, a moon of Saturn which has an atmosphere composed primarily of methane. Methane so dense it actually condensed and fell like rain, making stream beds and other landscape features. But sunlight breaks down methane, and there is no known source for the huge volumes of methane on Titan. So again, we see the admission that there's indications of the moon's youth, exactly what the creationists and many evolutionists have been saying for decades. McKee sums it all up nicely in talking about these problems and the proposed solutions to the problems with a naturalistic model. Some such proposals make planetary researchers uncomfortable because it is statistically unlikely that humans would catch any one object engaged 
in unusual activity, let alone several. And she's absolutely right. The more likely explanation is that it's not unusual activity, simply because there is no deep time. All of these planets and moons are young, not billions of years old. Evolutionary models have failed to fit the facts, whereas the models of a young creation not only fit the facts well, they have even predicted discoveries that were made. The evidence backs up what King David wrote 3,000 years ago. The heavens declare the glory of God. The one who adorned Saturn with all its beautiful crystals and rings around the planet. The one who created Io with the specific knowledge that his ultimate creation, us, would construct spacecraft to go and visit moons far, far away. The one who created the massive planet of Jupiter. That creator is calling out to you today. You've been separated from him by your sins, your disobedience in doing what you knew was wrong, because that creator had inscribed upon your heart what was right and wrong. Those sins separate you from the creator and forbid you from entering into the new heaven and new earth. But that creator created a body to live in and to sacrifice in place of you and I for our sins. He died on the cross because he was the only one who had never sinned and could pay the price for our sins. He's calling out to you today to make him the Lord of your life, to turn from your sins. Ask him to forgive you of your sins and to make you anew. What he called being born again. What is your response to his call? This show is sponsored in part by Canada's first permanent creation museum in the heart of Alberta's dinosaur beds, the Big Valley Creation Science Museum at bvcsm.com. And by Genesis Park, where you can pre-order your own beautiful, hard-covered copy of the Chronicles of Dinosauria, the history and mystery of dinosaurs and man. What does the Bible say about aliens? Is there life on other planets? What can science tell us about the possibility of aliens? Ian Juby gives answers to these and many more questions in this fascinating and highly disturbing subject. Looking analytically at the subject, complete with the testimonies of people who claim to have been abducted by aliens, the answers will probably surprise you. In this one and a half hour lecture, Ian shows that the alleged aliens are a problem and that Jesus is the solution. Order online today at Ian's Bookstore. to our flood of evidence episode, YouTuber Andrew Gulick wrote in, I subbed for a science class today and part of the lesson showed mountainous regions with folded and bent rock layers without any fracturing. I have to be careful not to contradict the regular teacher, but I asked them a simple logical question. I asked if the rock layers in the mountain were folded like that while it was hardened solid rock, or if they were bent while it was still yet soft mud layers. The kids said that they had to be bent while still soft mud. Logical response to a simple question. YouTuber 2 Carpets 1875 then tried to take Andrew Gulick to task, saying, If this is what you did tell them, and you're a teacher, you should be struck off. Folding of rock is entirely, completely, and absolutely understood. Your disbelief of this does not make it untrue, and your suggestion to a class of students is deeply unprofessional. With respect to Carpets, Gulick is right on the money. The dramatically folded rocks we see around the world can only be folded when soft, especially mountains where we are talking literally thousands of feet of rock layers tightly folded in recumbent folds. The layers on the outside have to stretch farther. And rocks are very weak in tensile strength, so they would crack and break. This fact is inadvertently acknowledged by the attempts of those who believe in deep time, who say the rocks were subducted to incredible depths, bent, 
then exhumed back up to the surface. Now, why would they say this? Because they need the incredible heating of the rock in order to make it soft and pliable enough to bend it. So by subducting it deep into the parts of the earth where it's hot, they get the heat they're looking for. So such geologists have just admitted that the rocks have to be soft in order to bend. So besides the fact that there is no known process to subduct these rocks to such incredible depths, and certainly no evidence that this happened, it is strictly an ad hoc argument. But let's assume for a second that the rocks were, in fact, subducted underground where the rock got hot enough to become soft. Well, these rocks are typically limestone, which then turns into marble under extreme heat and pressure, a process called metamorphosis. This did not happen because it's still limestone. Furthermore, these rocks are loaded with fossils, which get destroyed under extreme heat and pressure. No, the rocks were bent when they were cold and soft. That's what the evidence shows. Gulick was right on the money. If you'll recall, I responded last week to an excellent question from Christina in Alberta, who asked how Noah got all the animals from different continents and questions like that. She wrote in again. I'm a little confused on the concept of dogs evolving into dogs. If there was only one kind, meaning taxonomic order or family, how did it breed into the many species there are today? The term kind kind of throws me for a loop. Bit of a hazy definition there. My second question is regarding your anecdote about animals moving to higher ground. Are you just suggesting that Noah built the ark on a hill and the animals came there instinctively? Now, actually, most of the dog breeds have actually been bred within historical times. My statement about dogs evolving into dogs was a rhetorical statement, uh, pointing out that there was no evolution that had gone on. They're still dogs, and they are not different species or kinds, though there are some who try to portray them as different species. Now, that word kind comes from the Bible. Genesis chapter 1, where God repeatedly said he created things to reproduce after their kind. Now, there is a problem in defining both the terms species and kind, which I kind of alluded to in my response, but I left it out due to time. No matter how you define a species, there are exceptions. For example, if you define a species as creatures which can produce fertile offspring, what about humans who are sterile? Are they no longer considered part of the human species? And what about bacteria which reproduce asexually? Even evolutionist Ernst Mayer documented some five different definitions for species, and there's been quite a few definitions added since his time. The problem there lay in the fact that an evolutionist may believe in evolution because they saw a new species that had arisen. All of a sudden, evolution is philosophical because this person's interpretation of what they saw has been altered by their particular definition of what a species is. Now, if I've lost you, don't worry, that's the point. <laughs> it's a confusing mess. <laughs> there is no agreed upon definition for species. Now, with regard to what a kind is, there is much discussion within the creation community about it, and they call it baraminology, after the Hebrew word baramin, which is the word used for kind. Now, I'd go with the definition provided by that word in Strong's Concordance. Groups of living organisms belong in the same created kind if they have descended from the same ancestral gene pool. This does not preclude new species because this represents a partitioning of the original gene pool. Information is lost or conserved, not gained. A new species could arise when a population is isolated and interbreeding occurs. By this definition, a new species is not a new kind, but a further partitioning of an existing kind. For instance, we discussed ring species in a previous show. These seagulls, which are called ring species, are both still seagulls. Because they descended from the same bird, they are the same kind. But because the two gulls no longer interbreed, 
they are called different species. Do you see the difference? With regards to animals going uphill to avoid a flood, my point was simply that when we observe what happened at the Indonesian tsunami, the animals knew there was a flood coming and did something about it. The people did not. Now, that was all, as I mentioned, uh, the Bible seems to suggest that God brought the animals to Noah. Oren wrote in from Colorado. Dear Ian, anti-creationists are always insisting that dinosaurs died out long before humans walked the earth. We've seen plenty of evidence, both physical and historical, that our races coexisted. What evidence do evolutionists and anti-creationists draw on to back up their claim that they did not? Excellent question, Oren. Thanks for writing in. The response is about identical to the argument I had with Captain Antagonator over the Laetoli footprints being completely human. Captain, aren't you excited by this find of completely modern human footprints in 3.7 million year old rock? We know that those are not human footprints because we do not find human fossils in rocks that mm, old. You just did. Fossil human footprints. No, those cannot be human footprints. Why not? Because we do not find fossil human footprints in rocks that old. You just did. No, you are a simpleton who does not understand the complexities of paleontology. They cannot be fossil human footprints. Humans had not yet evolved at that time. How do you know? Because we only find remains from our ancient ape-like ancestors in rocks that old. But what about these fossil footprints? They must be from our ancient ape-like ancestors. But they're completely modern human footprints, and they don't match the feet of your ape-like ancestors. Only an idiot would believe that. They cannot be human footprints because the rocks they are in are too old. But they are completely modern human footprints, thus proving that humans were around at that time. How can you be so stupid and still host a webcast? You know, I can give you the number of a good doctor who could rent you a good brain for a day. Humans were not around 3.7 million years ago. That's a scientific fact. Winning! But these footprints are proof that humans were around at that time. Winning! But I'll let those who do not believe dinosaurs and humans coexisted speak for themselves. Please, write in and tell us your response. What is your proof that humans and dinosaurs did not coexist? You can send in your comments to us in a number of ways. That's a wrap for today. I'm your host, Ian Juby, signing off for now. Thank you for watching, and please join us again next Genesis week. Remember those words of warning from our Creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. We'll see you on the flip side. We need your support to keep this program on the air. Please pray for us. And if you wish to financially support the program, Canadians can make a tax-deductible donation to CORE Ottawa, Canada North Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, K2K2P4. While we cannot offer tax-deductible receipts outside of Canada, donors wishing to financially support the program can do so online at enjuby.org slash donations.html. And thank you for your support. Thank you.